The Republican Party is finalizing its platform tonight. Their convention starts next week. And that means that this is basically right now the formal end of the Republican primary process and what has just been a wild presidential election year. I mean, we should have known it was going to be a wild year when it started off so strangely, right? Do you remember when Mitt Romney won the Iowa caucuses? Mitt Romney won the Iowa caucuses for a second. The Iowa Republican Party that night of the Iowa caucuses announced Mitt Romney as the winner. But then a little while later, they tried to announce that actually it had been a tie between Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum. But then shortly after that, they eventually admitted, okay, yeah, no, both of those were wrong. Turns out Rick Santorum won the Iowa caucuses. But then ultimately, when it came down to allocating, all allocating the delegates that are what you win when you win the Iowa caucuses, the delegates who will go to the convention next week, in Iowa, it turns out that the winner was neither Mitt Romney nor Rick Santorum. The winner was somebody else altogether. It was Ron Paul. The Republican presidential nomination process this year just started in chaos in Iowa, and it got weirder from there. I mean, just about the only guy who didn't win Iowa was Rick Perry. Remember poor Rick Perry? He was almost the favorite at the start of the process. He got into the race late to tons of acclaim, tons of excitement, and he tried very hard. It wasn't like he was Fred Thompson or Rudy Giuliani who had basically refused to campaign in 2008. Rick Perry really tried. He just couldn't win anything. And so it sort of got lost in the shuffle this campaign season, once Mr. Perry lost so badly. But there was one remarkable moment from Rick Perry in the campaign that has suddenly become newly relevant in where the campaign's at now. Uh, here's how it happened. It was exactly one week before the Iowa caucuses. Rick Perry, who had long been a staunch anti-abortion politician, exactly a week before the Iowa caucuses, Rick Perry told a conservative Iowa minister in front of his parishioners that he had had a change of heart on the issue of abortion. Here's how we, we reported it at the time. Another sign, I think, of Rick Perry banking hard for the evangelical social conservative vote. Uh, his announcement at a campaign event in Iowa last night, sort of striking announcement, uh, that he's changed his mind on abortion. He said, seeing Mike Huckabee's DVD about abortion has caused him to change his stance on the issue. Uh, even though Rick Perry is very, very anti-abortion, he is for criminalizing it, Mr. Perry used to believe that the government shouldn't force rape victims or victims of incest to bear the child of their rapist or of their incestuous um, attacker. Now, though, after seeing Mike Huckabee's movie, Mr. Perry has decided that the government should, in fact, force victims of rape and incest to bear the child of the rape or incest. Uh, he even teared up a little bit when he was explaining it. The Mike Huckabee DVD that made Rick Perry change his mind on what he wants to force rape victims to do, the DVD that made him change his mind on that conveniently one week before the Iowa caucuses, uh, was a DVD called The Gift of Life. It's an anti-abortion movie that Mr. Huckabee hosts and he stars in it. Governor Huckabee's anti-abortion DVD also features an anti-abortion activist who specifically campaigns against abortion rights for rape victims. In addition to the DVD, Mr. Huckabee has also interviewed this activist on his TV show. Uh, and then in 2011, um, they both worked on the personhood campaign in Mississippi. You remember that. It was the, the ballot measure intended by its authors to ban some of the most popular forms of birth control, hormonal birth control and IUDs. Uh, it would also ban in vitro fertilization, not to mention all abortion, all abortion. And the folks running the personhood campaign in Mississippi were not shy about the fact that they wanted to ban all abortions, including an abortion sought by a victim of rape or incest. In fact, they campaigned on that aspect of the personhood measure. Mike Huckabee was a major spokesman and keynote speaker for the Mississippi personhood measure. The activist he featured in his DVD, the one that changed Rick Perry, and on Mr. Huckabee's TV show, that activist headlined a tour supporting the personhood bill, and the tour was called the Conceived in Rape Tour. That was part of the campaign for the personhood measure, not against it. I mean, the Mississippi campaign prided itself on its mission to force rape victims and incest victims who became pregnant as a result of those crimes to bring those pregnancies to term against their will. Forced childbearing against your will as a rape victim or an incest victim. The personhood campaign tried to turn the idea of forcing women in that circumstance to bear the child of their rapist. They tried to turn that into an asset for their campaign. 
Uh, but even in a place like Mississippi, even when the electorate is very conservative and very anti-abortion, frankly, that idea still sounds crazy and or repulsive, which is in part why the campaign against the personhood thing in Mississippi looked like this. I was just a normal Mississippi girl going to college and then I was abducted and raped. It changed everything. Initiative 26 doesn't make any exceptions for rape or incest. It goes too far. It would be so bad for women and families. I don't trust the government. I trust Mississippi families and women to make these important decisions. It's perfectly acceptable to be pro-life and against Initiative 26. That message worked in Mississippi. Personhood lost in Mississippi by do double digits last fall. In part because it turns out people do not like the idea of the government forcing rape victims to bear the child of their rapist. Even people who hold conservative anti-abortion beliefs believe that. But you know what might make that position seem more palatable? It might be more palatable if pregnant rape victims were a myth, if they didn't exist. If it's a legitimate rape, uh, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. That position that Congressman Todd Aiken took toward rape victims on Sunday that's made him so famous now, uh, it's not just Todd Aiken's position. I mean, it's not like equivalent to Scott Brown believing he confers with kings and queens when really he doesn't. Or remember when Christine O'Donnell assured the nation that there really are human mice hybrids? American scientific companies are crossbreeding humans and animals and coming up with with mice with fully functioning human brains. Yeah, the Todd Aiken thing is not like that. It's not just some weird thing that somebody in politics believes that nobody else can explain. Todd Aiken is not alone in believing that lady parts have a specific magic that can tell the difference between rapist sperm and happy to have you here sperm. Todd Aiken's crazy theory is in fact something that a lot of people on the right and a lot of people in the anti-abortion movement not only believe, but they've been willing to talk about it for years. George W. Bush appointed a man who believed this to be the chief judge of the Eastern District Federal Court in the state of Arkansas. Some people on the right this week, like, like the American Family Association, have been saying that Todd Aiken is absolutely correct on this subject. When you ask these folks to cite their sources, most often they cite a guy who is a former president of the National Right to Life Committee. The New York Times interviewed him this week and he still absolutely believes this, that you can't get pregnant from a rape. Here's what he said about rape to the New York Times today. He said, this is a traumatic thing. She's, shall we say, she's uptight. She is frightened, tight, and so on. And sperm, if deposited in her vagina, are less likely to be able to fertilize. The tubes are spastic. The tubes are who now? That, that guy, the spastic tubes guy, was a Mitt Romney supporter in the last election in 2008. Um, at the time, the Romney campaign called Dr. Spastic Tubes, quote, an important surrogate for Governor Romney's pro-life and pro-family agenda. The New York Times, being the New York Times, in interviewing the spastic tubes doctor today, uh, decided to fact check him, the guy from the Right to Life, uh, the Right to Life Committee, who was the big Mitt Romney endorser in 2008. They fact checked him and it did not go well. Uh, they talked to an obstetrics and gynecology professor at the University of North Carolina. He said, quote, to suggest that there's some biological reason why women couldn't get pregnant during a rape is absurd. Uh, my favorite, though, was the quote from the Harvard Medical School professor of reproductive biology who responded to the Times simply by saying, there are no words. There are no words for this. It is just nuts. Well put. But the thing that is missing from the whole political freakout, the whole Republican freakout and the broader political freakout over Todd Aiken having said this wackadoo theory from the spastic tubes right to life guy out loud while he's running for Senate, the thing that is missing from the uproar here is that there is a reason people keep talking about this crazy theory. There's a reason the anti-abortion right had to invent this easily disprovable lie about basic human biology in the first place. Every time it surfaces in the mainstream, it gets debunked, but even after debunking, it keeps circulating on the anti-abortion right. It keeps coming back. Why do they need to keep bringing it back? It's because if you believe that rape victims don't get pregnant, you don't have to feel bad about using the law against impregnated rape victims. Because after all, they don't exist. I mean, Todd Aiken still supports the same policy position he outlined on Sunday, the one the personhood folks campaigned on, the idea that the government should force the victims of rape and incest to bring pregnancies resulting from those crimes to term. 
Todd Akin has apologized for saying that fake science anti-abortion fairy tale thing about rape in the way that he said it on Sunday, but he's not retracted his policy position that's based on that idea. And now that it's caused something of a firestorm, he's apologizing for the wording of the rationale for the government forcing women who have been raped to give birth against their will. He's apologizing for the way he described that rationale, saying at one point that he got one word wrong in one sentence. But he's not changing his policy. He still wants rape victims to be forced by the government to bear the child of their rapist against their will. And that is a very common position in Republican politics right now. It's a position that is shared by the Republican Party officially, which adopted it into their official party platform today. That will be ratified presumably on Monday. We'll be talking about that a little bit later on the show tonight. It's a position that is shared by the Republican soon to be vice presidential nominee. When he was first running for Congress in 1998, Here's how Paul Ryan was explaining his position on abortion. This is quoting from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in 1998. Ryan, a 28-year-old first-time candidate, said he has consistently opposed legal abortion and makes only one exception, cases in which a doctor deems an abortion necessary to save the mother's life. He favors overturning the Supreme Court's landmark Roe versus Wade decision that made most abortions legal, Ryan said, and he would let states decide what criminal penalties would be attached to abortions. This is a nice detail. Ryan said he has never specifically advocated jailing women who have abortions or doctors who perform them, but he added, if it's illegal, it's illegal. So presumably the states would make it illegal and would prescribe jail terms for women and that would be okay with him. Um, Paul Ryan, even in his first run for Congress, was running on criminalizing abortion with no exceptions for rape victims and incest victims. And he was running on sending women and doctors to jail, right? If it's illegal, it's illegal. Paul Ryan is said to have called Todd Aiken yesterday to talk to him about getting out of the Missouri Senate race. Mitt Romney himself directly called for Todd Aiken to get out of the Missouri Senate race today. The Romney campaign's initial statement on Todd Aiken's comments on Sunday said that the campaign disagreed with Mr. Aiken. Quote, Governor Romney and Congressman Ryan disagree with Mr. Aiken's statement. A Romney-Ryan administration would not oppose abortion in instances of rape. That's new. That's new for Paul Ryan, at least. And it's sort of new for Mitt Romney, too. Since that initial statement was released, Paul Ryan has made no less than six public appearances. How has he avoided, at all of these appearances, being asked about this brand new policy position that he's now advocating as part of this presidential ticket now that he wants to be vice president? It's in total contradiction to every policy stance and vote and relevant sponsorship he has taken as a congressman. The only difference between Paul Ryan's position and Todd Akin's position is that Todd Akin, in an interview, is willing to use fake science to pretend like rape and incest pregnancies don't exist, so therefore we don't have to feel bad about banning them. Paul Ryan has not bothered to feed you the fake science. He, by apparently this disagreement statement they put out, that presumably means he knows that rape victims and incest victims do sometimes get pregnant. And he knows what he wants the government to force those women to do is to bear those pregnancies to term against their will. But think about the big picture here for a second. Between those two guys, between Aiken and Ryan, which one is worse? Saying you want to force a woman who has just conceived against her will to also give birth against her will by order of the government? Or telling yourself a fake science fairy tale so you can pretend that those women don't exist and you would never want the kind of government that would do something so barbaric to a woman for nine months after the barbarism that was done to her in the incident of rape. Which is worse, the person with the fairy tale or the person without one? Because they both want the same policy either way. It's just that in the newfangled Republican Mike Huckabee way of justifying it, they drop the fake science fairy tale they don't bother trying to make it seem less barbaric.